Well, how is everybody? Blessed. Good. Good. All right. So, uh, you have something you want to praise the Lord for? My daughter was baptized Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I've been blessed all week. Oh, yeah. Praise God. That's a good praise. That's, that is very good news. Praise the Lord. Yeah, what else? I thank the Lord for answered prayers. Yes, amen. amen. Sometimes, you know, we pray and we there's a labor in prayer. And there's a season of the prayer, you know, and so um, sometimes the the labor and the time um, that we have to spend in prayer until we see the answer. Sometimes there's a there's a spell there that we have to just trust and keep praying. You know. So, what else? <clears throat> Some folks making cookies yesterday evening for people, um, uh, for residents in uh, some facilities near near at hand, and uh, just just thank God for that. I even sampled two cookies. <laughs> yeah, they were. <laughs> that's what I asked. Well, wait, no, when no else got in. What's that? I said that's what I asked. How come nobody else got in here? Well, you weren't here. I know. <laughs> that, that's why. <laughs> um, as you know, of course, um, there's a lot going on in our country right now. A lot of folks uh, who are still missing. A lot of people have lost everything um, uh, materially and loved ones and so forth. So we really need to pray uh, for those. And then to pray for those who are really mobilizing to reach them. There are a lot of folks... I'd say communities, but it's as if the communities have been, many of them have just been washed away. So a lot of people, though, um, that are um, in need of being reached, um, somebody showing up with food and things like that, people are trapped still. Uh, so uh, remember those. We have, <clears throat> I shared uh, about uh, disaster relief. There are thousands of people who mobilized to try to bring not only supplies, but people who can do the legwork, so to speak, and the, the work of clearing roads and making ways to get to people and setting up emergency shelters and, and um, uh, feeding stations and so forth. Uh, so there's that. And, um, um, and uh, with Heaven Sent Ministries, with whom we partnered to do the food packaging, they're mobilizing supplies and materials and things to take to those regions as well. So, uh, so uh, just Pray, pray about that. You know, I think also we need to be praying about the elections and that that people would follow God mm -hmm. in voting. And also, um, Zach, hurry us back. Let's pray for you. Yeah. Yeah, so Zach would appreciate that. And definitely I agree, you know, the uh, opportunity to have a have a have a have a role in contributing to the direction our country goes uh, in a, in a physical way. The vote uh, we need to use that power accordingly and for God's glory. Uh, and in particular, I'll say you know um, it is the especially the presidential election, but other elections too. It, in, in, a year ago in Ohio, as you know, there was an issue that was passed that uh, made abortion more. Excessive, not just more accessible, it just opened wide the door uh, and, and actually made it a constitutional amendment. And we really lost ground with that. So from a human point of view, that was tragic. From a spiritual point of view, it really speaks to the, the spiritual posture of our country. And I think that of the things we need to pray, we need, voting is very important, but we need to pray that, there, that God would change our hearts. He'd cause us to repent of our sin, not just the sin of abortion, although that, but also just start our, our turning our back on him in general and, um, uh, and come back to him. 
So uh, don't forget the, the work of prayer and, and its role in uh, the direction of our country. I can't wait till it's over. There's so much life. <clears throat> yeah, I don't disagree, Your Honor. So, no. Well, let's go ahead and pray. And uh, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for uh, your ever-listening ear, Father. We are your children, and we realize that um, as, uh, as you have done the work of not only saving us, Father, and bringing us into relationship with yourself, Lord, you have undertaken, Lord, the, uh, the, um, this relationship with us that allows us, Father, to call upon your name. And Father, it pleases you when we do so. And when we do so, Lord, with, with you as our heart's desire, with this, our seeking you first in all things. And, and Father, uh, it pleases you to have us come to you with the burdens of our lives, the requests, Lord, that have been shared, the needs, Father, that we and our families, Lord, experiencing. And Father, you also give to us a responsibility to pray and to intercede and, and to participate in the ministry of prayer, Father, for people that we maybe we don't even know. And Lord, we realize that there are people, many thousands and thousands and thousands of people right now who have been deeply affected by uh, unexpected and tragic uh, events, Father. And Lord, uh, we pray, Lord God, that you will help your people to, to be mobilized, to rise up, to share the love of Christ and the hope of Christ. And we pray, Lord, that, um, that you'll get uh, the, the resources that are, that are needed, food, water, electricity, Father, uh, shelter. And Father, that as you um, work through those material and physical needs, Lord, you'll also open people's hearts to their spiritual need for Jesus Christ. And uh, Lord, we pray that uh, however you would lead us to participate in this ministry, Father, we pray that you'll help us to understand how to do that and, and, and move us, Lord, to do so. Uh, Lord, we pray um, in thanksgiving for answered prayer, as was said. We thank you, Lord, for hearing us and for uh, bearing upon yourself the burdens, Lord, of our lives. We thank you, Lord, that uh, as we talk about the needs and share these needs, Father, and lift them up to you, Lord, you are faithful to address them. And so we pray, Lord, for the, the, the members of our body, Father, who are suffering and, and experiencing difficulties and challenges, Lord, and have uncertain things before them. And we pray, Father, that you would help them to be deeply aware of your presence, Lord, and to help them know, Lord, that, that as they have trusted you as Lord and Savior, Father, you are faithful to attend to them, Lord, and to be present with them, Lord, in the midst of their needs. And Lord, we pray that uh, spiritually you would encourage and challenge, Lord, each person that we mentioned tonight. You would, you would comfort them. You would in, in, in increase their uh, awareness, Lord, of what it is that you're doing in their lives, Father, and how you're deepening their relationship with you. And we pray, Lord, that you'll help us also to realize, Lord, that you're at work in us too, so that, Lord, we might know what it means to be a child of God and then to walk true truly as disciples of Jesus. Father, you give to each of us here tonight a ministry. And together, you give us a ministry too. Individually, Lord, we have those opportunities to share your love and practical ways to share your truth. And Father, as a body, Lord, you give us a unique opportunity, Lord, in our community to share Jesus and to show Jesus and how we conduct ourselves, how we proclaim the gospel, how we encourage one another, how we grow in the things that are of your spirit. And so, Lord, tonight we pray that as we read your word, you would help us, Lord, to apprehend, Lord, those truths, Lord, that, that you want us to, to uh, experience in a more fulfilling and more powerful way than we've ever done so before. And Lord, we pray that our lives would be yielded to you, and that through us, Lord, you would be glorified. Uh, we thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness, and we praise you. Uh, you are King, you are Lord, you are Savior, you are, Savior, you are our Shepherd, Lord. You are our mighty warrior, our strong tower, Lord. And Lord, you are our comforter and friend. And so we praise you and we thank you, Lord. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, if I were to ask the question and uh, how we've talked about the things we've talked about the last couple of weeks in Bible study, and uh, we've 
as you know, we, we've begun to process um, the, the contents of the letter that Paul writes to the people who dwell in the area of the region of Galatia. And what, what, is, what is the big issue that Paul is addressing as he writes to them? What are the Galatians falling into that he's concerned about? False oh, doctrine. The fall, I think false doctrine, right? And do you recall what specific false doctrine? Circumcision. Circumcision. And the gist of that, of course, is that th that the doctrine that they're uh, believing in or they're wandering into, so to speak, is that one must, to be a Christian, one must not only have faith in Jesus Christ, but one must do the works of the law. And that, in other words, you must essentially, if you're going to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, you must convert to Judaism. And uh, so what has happened is that the gospel message has encumbered baggage. Now, if you were to try to explain to just you know, somebody who was not aware of the message of Christianity, the message of the gospel, what is, what is the one thing you would really emphasize? I would guess that it has to do with God's grace. That it has to do with how God manifests grace to us, that we can receive the gift of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. I would say, if you were trying to share that with just you know, anybody, uh, that that would be the central theme. So the problem with what's happened here and what can happen to a church today is that what happens in Galatia is that um, that they'll, they'll say yes to all of that, but they'll say, but you also have to do such and such in order to be saved. And in this particular case, they have to take on the physical uh, mark of that uh, conversion, which is the circumcision. And, but that is part of the formal process of conversion. <clears throat> so, in essence, what, he's, what, what they're choosing to drift into, and I say they're choosing to drift into this because... They're, they are making choices. They're not simply... Um, they're, they're keeping their eyes... They're taking their eyes off of Christ and they're, they're looking at the law and they're drifting into that. So I guess that's what I'm trying to say in regard to that. So the gospel is encumbering baggage that shouldn't be there. So I, I think one of the beautiful things we can say about the gospel, what makes it so attractive... Uh, is that when we when we share it with somebody, what we say to them is something to the to the um, the, the degree of that you don't earn salvation, right? right. We agree with that. We don't earn salvation. You don't buy salvation. You can't keep the law and be saved. Um, although sometimes in some churches we'll pick up something. You know, we don't we don't think about it, but we'll say um, we'll, we'll say well. I, you know, I was saved, and but then I went out and um, I uh, I lied, or I stole something, right? So then I need to get saved again, right? Well, what's the problem with that? When we take the, the gospel at face value, because once you're saved, you're always saved. Okay, so a person who is well, if, if they're lying, they're they're maybe they're saved, but they're they're a disobedient child yeah, of God, and they're not, yeah. okay. All right, we have to we really have to iron that out because it's very confusing for a lot of people, and uh, it, there's often an idea that if I'm saved, that I won't stumble, I won't struggle with faith, and so forth. Now, as, as we know, as we grow as Christians, as we grow in our relationship with God, we grow in what it means to be. Father of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit is moving us, we are still capable of maybe lying or whatever right. the sin might be. But we have, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is convicting us of it. And, and, and putting in us, as the scriptures refer to it, a divine, a, a, a godly sorrow. And we're unhappy in our sin. A sinner can be happy in their sin. They can be content in their sin. 
because the Spirit of God is not in them. So this is okay. I'm, I'm all right with what I'm doing. I don't care. But as a Christian, I, that, I'm, I'm grieved by what I've done. The conviction of God is upon me and motivating me to repent, as First John 1 9 refers to it, and be cleansed of that sin and return and be restored in a, in a unhindered relationship, a full relationship with God. Now the Galatians, um, <coughs> they would say, yes, it's faith, it's faith, it's faith, it's faith. But they would say, it's faith and. Now anytime Christianity becomes faith and something to be saved, it's not faith anymore, is it? Yeah. It, it becomes a works relationship. Our works religion. And we, we understand works are important, but the motivating factor of our works is not tied to the fact, or tied to this pressure that I've got to do these things, I've got to measure up so I can be saved, I can be righteous enough for God, I've got to do this, I'm righteous enough, I've got to do that, I can't do this because I won't be righteous enough, that kind of thing. Um, Do you see the weight of that? Do you see how heavy that becomes? And how uncertain it becomes? If that is the nature of our understanding of our relationship with God, it really puts us in a position of anxiety, doesn't it? Because yeah. now our salvation you. comes back and it, it depends upon us. Yeah. Did I do enough to be saved? And I've heard Christians talk about this anxiety that they experience about whether or not they've done enough to be saved. Like, Wait a minute, what are you talking about? It, you know, you you can't do enough to be we saved. We can never do enough. No. You, it's all faith, all of it. Mm -hmm. And you need to take that weight off of yourself. Because they're, they're anxious because they're afraid. They're afraid that they won't measure up. And if that is our attitude about God, we have a complete misunderstanding of the God of the Bible. We're projecting upon the God of the Bible, the God of grace who saves us through faith alone, um, a worldly standard. And that's, that's not the case. God isn't like that. But we do our works out of the fact that we've been changed. So if I am saved, then my nature has been changed, and now I want to please God, and I want to walk in God's ways. I want to grow in my intimacy with Him. Does that make sense? So the Galatians are they're, they're drifting off. And that's not to say that the people who are Christians are not going, they're going to become unsaved, but their ability to share the gospel and help other people to come, come to saving faith in Jesus Christ is now compromised. As they share, as they talk about what it means to become a Christian, they're adding to it. Right? And so people hear, oh, I do this and I do that, and I'll be saved. Okay, great. I'll do that and then saved. And you can see how when Jesus says, not, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, I think that among those who will think they're okay with God and find that they're not, are those who've got this kind of thing um, contaminating their understanding of God and His truth. Does it make sense? Do you think most people think like most of us as Christians realized that when we accepted God, there was a profound love there, a feeling that you've never had before. And do you think some of them are thinking, have heard that and think, well, I, I didn't really feel that. I mean, you know what I'm trying to... I, I had a... Um, so are, what are, you, are you saying that... Um, I'm not saying... Or, or a person that thinks they may be saved, but they're unsure of it. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can talk to someone and tell them how you how you felt when you accepted the Lord and the the, the goodness that you felt, and they said, "Well, am I supposed to feel that?" Right. I think. Well, let me say this as a quick caveat about the relationship of our feelings and and the nature of our relationship with God. Our feelings are very tricky because they don't tell us the truth a lot of the time, even as Christians. And the reason I say that is that a lot of our a lot of our feelings, not all our feelings, but a lot of our feelings come out of us, and they're influenced by our circumstances, by our physiology, by our diet, by 
by the flesh. Now, happily, um, they are influenced by the spiritual things too. You know, and I think as we grow in our relationship, hopefully, the more freed our emotions are to the truths of God, and the more grounded we are in what God has to say. Um, so, if a person says that I know I was saved because I just felt so happy and I felt so joyful, I know this wasn't what you were getting at. Yeah, you're kind of going in reverse, but let me say this real quick. That a lot of people say, I know I was saved because I was so happy. I was so happy. And, uh, um, well, I'm glad you were happy, but that's not how you know you were saved. How is it that we know we're saved? His word. His word, right? You know, um, there are, there's a denomination who, it's not a denomination, it's a, it's a sect. Um, that um, says that I know I was saying it's very hard to talk to them when you talk about spiritual things when you're trying to share Christ because sometimes the default position there is that I know I'm saved because I have what they refer to as a burning in the bosom and that's an emotional response and I, I don't care you know, it doesn't matter about your emotional response to something if it is not grounded in what is true we can be deceived in our emotions uh, Christians can be deceived, and Satan attacks us with emotions. You know, if we have a down day, what is that? Satan, he, he exploits that, doesn't he? He begins to use that to try to convince us that we're not saved. And I think that may be kind of where you were headed with that. So if a person here, I should be so happy, and, and I didn't have this emotional experience, I wonder if I am saved. And they doubt it because they did not have the emotional response. So for them, I feel... I, I, would, I, I think it's important that we acknowledge our emotions and, 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 and I think it's important that we help train our flesh to learn the proper emotional response to the spiritual truths that we say we believe in. And what I mean is, if I'm having a circumstantially a bad day, but I, in my mind, and my heart, I'm thinking about just what God has done for me, and I begin to feel peace and joy in spite of the bad things that are happening in my circumstances, I'm training my flesh with God's help to learn to experience and to walk in the joy of the truth of God. But just because I'm unhappy doesn't mean I'm not saved. On the other hand, a person, as I said before, a person who is happy may not be saved. We can be, as I said, we can be happy in our sin. We can be content in our sin. So we have to get back to the truth of God. And and uh, when uh, you say that there, that this false doctrine, this false doctrine is simply this: that that you have to do something in order to round off or complete your salvation. And if you don't do it, you're you're not saved. Now, whether they meant for it to go that far, if they were trying to imply that, it doesn't matter because that's how people were taken. So it's important to address it. Um. Now, you may remember when we talked about Galatians chapter 1 and Galatians chapter 2, Paul is sort of giving a brief history of how this particular false doctrine has emerged and how it's been dealt with repeatedly. How um, Gentiles who come to faith in Jesus Christ are full Christians. They are accepted by God. They are given the gift of the Spirit. Can you think of the first Gentile Christians we know about? Because it, does, it describes them as the Spirit having uh, filled them and the household there up there up. Do you remember? There was a name. Paul had nothing to do with that episode. Cornelius. Cornelius. <clears throat> what was Cornelius? He was a Gentile. He was a Roman uh, officer, and his household came to faith and did the Holy Spirit withhold from him the fullness of God's presence in his life because he wasn't a Jew? No. He, the Holy Spirit came fully upon him. Why? Because he was, he was born again. He belonged to God. He was saved. He was, he was a Christian. They weren't called Christians yet at that point, but still, you know what I mean. So, Paul, he, he's writing this letter, as you know, in chapters 1 and 2. He's talking about... Here it is again. It, it came up here, and, and Peter, I even had to have an argument with Peter about it. Even though Peter agreed that Gentiles don't have to become Jews, but he's acting now, 
or was, he was acting as if they do have to become Jews because of the way he would distance himself from the Gentile believers to appease the Jewish believers who said that they had to uh, undergo circumcision. And we set that straight, and here I am again. And then, uh, it, and it's just a perfect uh, introduction to chapter 3 because this is how he's, he is expressing his, his astonishment when he says, O foolish Galatians, verse 1 of chapter 3. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? O foolish Galatians could be translated as you idiots of Galatia. You, you're, you're being idiotic. And he doesn't mean it in the sense that they're, not, they're stupid. What he means is that there's something they know, but they're not paying any attention to. It's like when you have knowledge, you know, you know that, uh, what's a good example? Um, <clears throat> um, you shouldn't go to McDonald's because you need it for your bills. Right, you take your, <laughs> your electric money, your, your grocery money, and you spend it. That's not a good example, though, but I think because, <laughs> I, was, I thought what I thought, but I thought Diane was going to say is, you shouldn't, you shouldn't go to McDonald's because over time, your heart, your cholesterol, and I thought that's what she was going to say because that's probably something I should hear. But uh. and she loved me, so that's what she cares. So she told me things like that. So watch out! Don't do these foolish things, right? Um, this is what. So he's he's communicating to them that they've already hashed this out. This is not new information for them. They shouldn't have to be revisiting this. But they're being foolish in the sense that they know better. They know against, like if we were driving and we see the red light and we run through it and we get a ticket. Well, we knew what, right? We, that was a gamble, wasn't it? We knew what we were getting ourselves into, or should have. We did something we knew not to do. And he's saying it in this sense. There's a, uh, well, I won't go into that. But I, um, yeah, you foolish, you idiotic. Galatians, you know better. But he says, who has bewitched you? Who has, who has led you astray? Who has deceived you? Who has put you under a spell? The devil. Pardon? The devil. Well, in a sense, that's true. So, he, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And he says this, he says, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now let me say, it, it wasn't, he's not saying that the Galatians were physically present when Jesus was crucified. Most of them were not. That's not what he means. What he's talking about is, he's been through here before. He's been through Galatia. And public portrayal here has more to do, illustratively, uh, with there being a billboard, for example. It's been, very, it's been made very plain, very public. It was on display. It, the, it's, salvation is by faith alone. We've covered this. We've covered this. There was nothing confusing about what we were saying. Um, there weren't any gray areas. But you've got, allowed yourself to be led astray. You've been bewitched. You've been tricked. You, you're believing something that's not true when you know the truth. <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's read from verses 2 through 9, please. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by, you, by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, And you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed among, along with Abraham, the man of faith. Right. So he's, he's uh, referring to how they had something good going on. 
They had experienced salvation. They had experienced the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit changing them, um, working in them, giving them life and fulfillment and purpose and uniting them in love. And they, were, they knew they were free. They were celebrating as, as, as God's children. And, and that was the work of the Holy Spirit in them. Having begun by the Spirit, he says, in verse 3, are you now being perfected by the flesh? It's interesting to me how I think sometimes this plays out for us too, in that as God moves in us and the days pass and we um, find ourselves going down whatever roads we go down, figuratively speaking, in our spiritual journeys and so forth, and how even, even after we experience all that God does for us, how seeds of discontent can be sown in us and how that then those seeds of discontentment can erupt in things that allow us to be led astray. You know, I think one of the most challenging things for most believers is this idea that the Christian walk is actually a daily thing. And, and it, it, we, do, we live it day by day, by day by day by day. And have you ever noticed how some people are constantly looking for a spiritual high. Is Christianity always a spiritual high? No. Can we always be on the mountaintop? No. There are people, though, who they'll, 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 they'll experience the high. They'll, they'll sense God working, and they're amazed, and they're in awe, and so forth. And then things get quiet. And then their reaction is, something's wrong. I'm not feeling the high. And so what do they do? What do they do? They, they run away from God. Well, they, they, they try to find it someplace else. Yeah. You know? And sometimes that will emerge, and, and they'll, in some cases that can be from a person who just moves from church to church to church to church to church because they're looking for something and they've forgotten that as a Christian, there are days that things are quiet, and there's, there's a, there's, I, I don't want to call it a grind, but, but sometimes it's almost like that. You know, the daily application of the truth of God sometimes is in seasons when we don't hear a lot from God. We may not feel a lot from God. But what do we do in those moments? What should we do? Go back to the truth. Right? So, and, and be reminded. So when we're feeling, maybe, well, where is God? And I think, I think what people will say, well, you know, I'm not really hearing from God. And I'll say, okay, I think the most important thing to do when you're feeling like this, you're feeling far from God, is to look at your life. Examine my heart. Like David prays, examine my heart and see if there's anything in me hindering my relationship with you and deal with it. Deal with that. But if you come to the end of that, you're thinking, I really... I, I don't see anything. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be trusting and, and I'm repenting as God shows me my pride or my fear or my laziness or whatever it is. And I'm trying to live surrendered and so forth. I'm just feeling like I'd like to really hear from God. Okay. Well, sometimes there are seasons when God is quiet. Now, I can't say that I know all the reasons for that. I know that one reason for it, though, is that sometimes God will allow us to go through seasons of quietness to cultivate in us a deeper hunger for Him. <coughs> but if I look, if I panic, if I panic, oh, I don't feel it, and I start to try to fill it in somehow, what am I doing? I'm taking my eyes off a of daily relationship of dependence upon Him, and I'm looking to something to fill it. And it could be, as I said earlier, it could be that you know, maybe I need to change church. Or I need to, maybe I need to do something more. Maybe God is wanting you to do something more. But if you're not clear on that, don't forge ahead and get ahead of him. But, but whatever you do, hang in there. Hang in there. I think the Galatians here, after God had begun this work in them, had entered the that period of time where, okay, now we do it day by day. We live, you know, and it was so new at one point. And some maybe began to feel a discontentment. Maybe they began to worry. Some began to want to find some other way to feel that high once again. And some people from outside, as Paul talks about them in chapter 2, 
people came from outside, they come in and they maybe make this helpful suggestion. Well, you, to really be spiritual, you need to fully convert to Judaism. You can practice the law and still be saved by faith. Do you see? The Galatians weren't trying to be infidels and heretics. They were looking to artificially patch something in their lives. And what they turned to was a gospel of works, which is not a gospel at all. Do you see? So, having begun by the Spirit, he says, are you now being perfected by the flesh? That's what he's saying. Is You started out well, so to really grow, are you going to, are you going to do these hyper-spiritual things so that you can be more spiritual than other people, that kind of thing? He then changes, he, he, well, in verse 5 he says, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the, the law or by hearing with faith? And he turns the conversation towards uh, their understanding of how it began in the first place with Abraham. Because most of them are thinking about, as they think about converting or becoming uh, better Christians by converting to Judaism, they're thinking about the law of Moses. So Paul, when he writes to them, he doesn't refer to Moses. Who does he refer to? Abraham. Abraham. Do you know why? I think that a very compelling reason that he does it is because Abraham, the Bible tells us, was his faith was counted to him as righteousness. What does that mean? That he had faith. That he had faith, and his faith then resulted in what? Him being right with the Lord. Right. Basically, it was by, he was saved through faith. Yeah. And this was before the Mosaic Law was given. So, Abraham, he was saved, but he wasn't saved by the law because the law hasn't been given yet. You see? So he refers to Abraham, who predates Moses, and he gets their minds oriented in the direction of what our salvation, as far as God is concerned, what our salvation actually rests upon. Our salvation rests upon what? Faith. 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 As the, and in verse 8, he says, uh, um, And the scripture foreseen that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. This gospel of faith. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. In other words, he's saying, you know, God was doing the saving thing in a way that we didn't understand, but still he was doing it before the law was even given. So, would somebody like to read verses 10 through 14? For as many, <clears throat> for as, many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them but that no one is justified by the law in sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for, as it, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree that the blessing of Abraham might come from the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Okay. So he talks about the works of the law, and the reason he has to talk about it this way, because when if, if they agree to uh, take on the sign of the, uh, of the law, which is the circumcision, that they are actually binding themselves to, they're, they're basically saying, we're going to keep the law, they, they, because the circumcision was a sign that they're going to keep the law. That's what that association is. So they're saying we're going to keep the law in order to be fully saved. But the law is all about the curse. And this is what I mean. The law is given, and the law is perfect in that it is given from God, a perfect holy God. 
So the law in of itself is not wrong. In fact, it's extremely right. The problem is, is that we cannot fully keep it. And the word curse there has to do with condemnation. All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, are under condemnation. They are under judgment because they cannot and do not fully live up to the requirements of the law because you can't keep part of the law. If you break one part, you break the whole thing. Right. Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. And then in verse 11, he, he explains that. Now it's evident, it's clear, that no one is justified before God by the law. Why is that? No one is justified before God through the law? Because nobody can keep it. Right. The righteous instead do what? In verse 11, the end of verse 11. The righteous shall live by faith. Those who are standing upright before God, those who are counted as righteous before God, are not counted righteous because they kept the law. Because if that were the criteria, then we've all blown it. We're all bent. We're not upright. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. And again, that goes back to if you do one part, you've got to do the whole thing. Christ redeemed us from the curse or the responsibility of fulfilling the law by becoming a curse for us, by bearing for us our judgment. And how did he do that? Well, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. Was Jesus hanged on a tree? He, sh he sure was. He's the one who's hanged on a tree. And because he was, everyone that is in Christ Jesus receives the blessing of Abraham. That blessing of Abraham, that blessing that God extended to Abraham, which was righteousness, it, it, was, it wasn't that Abraham in his personal essence was righteous before God, was it? It was that God counted him as righteous. Because of his faith. Because of his faith. God counted him as righteous. You and I aren't righteous on our own. We're counted as righteous because Jesus bore the curse for us. The judgment we deserve when he hung on the tree. And he does this, why? So that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Uh, verses 15 through 20, please. <clears throat> were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, he and two offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterwards does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an inter intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Okay. So when God makes the promise to Abraham, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. If that condition were dependent upon the keeping of the law, it would not happen. And so, in other words... The, it, that the keeping of the law would have annulled, that's what he's referring to, that would have annulled the promise that God gave to Abraham. But that promise was not annulled because our, our righteousness, our salvation, the, 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 the outpouring of God's blessing to all the nations of the earth had nothing to do with the law. It had to do with the offspring that it refers to uh, at the end of uh, uh, verse 16. <clears throat> So, verse 19, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. But somebody would like to read verses 21 through the end of the chapter. 
Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under, under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Okay, so what are some reasons that the law then has been given? Just to kind of give us something to, like a guideline to go by until we were able to accept faith. Okay, it shows us the standards of God's holiness, his righteousness. Yeah, we, we, we learn about God's character, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, as we learn the law. It's true. And it does serve, sort of serve as a, he refers to the law as a guardian. Yeah. Yeah, and so it, it gives us a, uh, standard by which we should behave and act and, and so forth. I was thinking about this a little bit and earlier today and I was thinking about um, you know one of the one of the amazing things that God um, brings to us in our experience is that God keeps his promises. So I think one of the assurances that we can have that God keeps his promises is that God had upheld him upheld the law. Now, remember, God did not nullify the law. God fulfilled the law in Jesus Christ. God didn't say the law is bad and threw it out the window. God didn't say, I changed my mind. Jesus fulfilled the law. He lived a sinless life. It's important for us to remember that, that when he died on the cross, that he did so completely innocent. There was no breaking of the law of God. He did not die because of condemnation that he earned. He died because of the condemnation we earned. There's a note here on one of the like the Bible says, the law does not make us sinners. It reveals that we already are sinners. Mm -hmm. It diagnoses the problem of sin. And if we did not have the law, then it would be harder for us to understand that we needed a Savior. Yeah. It helps us kind of know what sin is. Mm hmm You yeah. know, I guess it's a good for that. That's right. And we know that sin is a thing because there is a law, and the law is holy, and it's right, and it upholds what is right. But let me say this, too. The fact that God saw to it that, that the law was um, vindicated by the life and the death of Jesus Christ, that because he upheld the law unto, unto its bitter end, so to speak, that if he's that committed and serious to the upholding of his word, even when it's very difficult and unpleasant, that when God makes any kind of promise to us, he will uphold that also. The proof of that is that God, God sent Jesus to die. Jesus upheld the law because he gave his life to satisfy the law. And so if God, and, and that was a fulfillment of promise, a fulfillment of God's word. So if, as God declares things to us through his word, that you are mine, you are saved, your sins are forgiven, you are made new, you are not under judgment, even if the world says we are, and our emotions tell us we are. You were, his word says you are not any of those things anymore. You are new, you are free, you are alive forever and ever and ever and ever. We can believe it with 100% certainty because Jesus died on the cross. Because God fulfilled his law. And because he did, 
we can rest assured that he's not fickle. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't forget things. He pursues things and does everything he says he'll do. I find that reassuring. I'm deeply encouraged by that. <clears throat> Consider what you were before you were saved. You know, even if you were saved as a child, you may not have understood this, but think about think think backward and think about how you were, as the scriptures describe you, you were a captive, right? You were a captive. You're a captive to that old nature. You're a captive to your sin. You were a captive to the, the, uh, the condemnation of that sin, the punishment for that sin, and the doom that would await you if that were not resolved through Jesus. You were held captive, as verse 23 describes it. In fact, now that we are his children, we put on Christ. Notice in verse 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ, having been saved, having been immersed and sharing in his death through faith and being raised up into new life, you put on Christ. What does that mean? Except this, that you're not clothed in your old filthy garments anymore, your own your old mistakes, all the ways the world has defined you, maybe even things your parents have said about you or um, whatever your own failures have told you about yourself. You're not dressed in God's eyes in those clothes. You're wearing what? For whom? What does it say? Verse 27. You're wearing Christ. You're wrapped up in him. What does that mean then? As the Father looks at you, what does he see then? Jesus. He sees Jesus. That's right. He sees Jesus. And in verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither, there's no male and female, right? And he doesn't, he's not saying, well, you're not a man anymore, you're not a woman anymore. That's not what he means. You're not a you're, you may still ethnically be a Jew and, and, and so forth, or a Gentile, or whatever you were. What he's saying is, is that there, you're all in Christ. If, as far as the Father is concerned, you have the same status as any other believer. So, and remember what he's addressing. You remember that the, what he's specifically addressing is the fact that that the the false doctrine that they have fallen into has had a physical consequence, and that is that Jewish believers don't eat with the Gentile believers, right? Wasn't that what we talked about last week? And even Peter was affected by that. Even Titus was affected by it. And they both knew better. No, there is no second class Christian. You're children of God. We eat together. We live together. We're all the same in that regard. Isn't that beautiful? We can all fellowship, and, and there's no there's no shame. And I'm just not as good a Christian as this person. I'm just not as good a Christian as that person because I come from something different, or because I don't do these hyper spiritual things that they do. I don't keep the I don't know, keep the law the way that they do. Whatever. I think we I think the church sometimes there are churches that I think adopt versions of that. They may not be Jewish in nature or, or in origin per se, but I think there is sometimes this uh, clutter of these hyper-spiritual activities that we will do because we think they make us better Christians or more better Christians than other people. And that's what was happening here. No, no, there's neither Jew, there's no, there aren't Greeks, there's no slave or free or male and female. There's, it's not about being and we, today, we might look at it from a, from a national standpoint. You know, as far as heaven is concerned, as far as the kingdom of God is concerned, we're not, it's not about being American or being African. It's not about being white or black or being rich or poor or, you know, whatever it is. We all come to the table and we eat together the things, the food of God. <laughs> and that, that's a beautiful thing. Okay, what other thoughts? Any final thoughts on any of this?
let me just say this as we just kind of close. I, I, I think sometimes, this is a conversation I've had with believers, and I think a particular way that Christians struggle today is this fear of not being good enough. And there is a whole world of baggage in that. Um, we don't measure up. I'm not as good as this person. I'm not as smart or spiritual. I don't pray as good. I don't. I'm not as brave when it comes to sharing the gospel and things like that. You know, these are things that, that, that as we walk with God, He He helps us with those things. But we will look with human eyes at those things, and we'll feel so inadequate. And we'll feel that compared to all these other people that uh, i got to do more. i got to do more. I'll be a better Christian if I do more. I'll be, i got to prove something. Watch out. You don't have to prove anything. Walk with Jesus. Just walk with Jesus. Keep your eyes on Him. Remember your worth comes from Him. <coughs> Remember you're His child. According to promise. As verse 29 says. His promise. Let's close with prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you're on your throne, and that, Lord, you have done the perfect work. You have declared your promise for us, Lord, and, and fulfilled it in the person of Jesus. Lord, as we read your word, as we hear these things that have flown, have flown from your throne, Lord, to our hearts tonight, Lord, we pray that, that you would help us to walk in the power of them to live in the truth of the Lord and to be free, to feel free. And Lord, wherever we're tempted to, to take on the slavery of the world, the slavery of some legalistic version of Christianity, Father, you would just, you would quickly uh, reveal that for an error, a, a lie, a mistake, Lord, and bring us to back to the simple truth, Lord, that we're saved by your grace through faith. We don't have to prove anything. We're not better Christians because we do more than other Christians. But Lord, we do want to be fruitful Christians. We want to live lives that are fully trusting you. And Lord, wherever we're not trusting you like we should, where our eyes are wandering away from you, Lord, help us Lord, to just really come back to you and to be renewed in, in our sense of what it means to be a forgiven child of God, ransomed from our sin and made your child. Thank you for grace. Oh, the sweet grace of Jesus. Thank you. Help us now to live, Lord, in the power of that grace through faith. And I pray your blessings on each one tonight. Encourage them. Strengthen them. Help them, Lord. Help their eyes to remain on you, Lord, as you work out your will in them and through them. I pray this in Jesus, our Savior's name. Thank you, everyone.